Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we are here with Dr. Miriam Eisenstein Ebsworth in her lovely home in South Orange, New Jersey. And Miriam is an expert in bilingualism, bilingual education, and multiculturalism. Uh, she is the former chair of the bilingual department uh, doctoral program at NYU and she is one of the leading experts in these areas. And we want to just spend a nice hour with Miriam and get her insights into a field that you very rarely hear talked about in depth on, on television and really get her perspective on these issues and why bilingualism matters, what is what she calls the bilingual advantage, okay? And all these things, and we wanna uh, cover it in, in a way that the average person would understand too. We don't wanna you know, hit you with too much jargon, but we need some jargon, but we just wanna educate and enlighten our audience on what bilingualism is. But let's start with you, Miriam, and your biography, and what brought you to this amazing uh, field of uh, looking at language and looking at you know, the beauty of different cultures and how they blend together. I mean, my wife, Claudia, she's from uh, Latino background, she's from Colombia, so I'm very much living this reality that you talk about. So how did you first come to bilingualism? Well, I think I came to it yeah. for therapy because, um, oh, and first of all, I'm actually in, the de in Steinhardt in the Department of Teaching and Learning, oh. and within, within that department there's yes. a unit called Multilingual Multicultural Studies. Oh. And then within that unit, there, is, uh, there are two doctoral programs, one in bilingual education and one in TESOL. Mm. And I did direct those programs for many years. And now uh, I'm no longer the director of those programs. I'm an associate professor. And I also uh, am uh, the academic chair of a program for uh, an English program for the families of our international students and scholars. Wow. Uh, so how did I get into it? Well, yes. my native language is Yiddish. <laughs> it's not English. Uh, my native language is Yiddish, and I learned English second. Uh, we, I, we lived with my grandfather, who spoke several languages. He spoke Russian, he spoke Ukrainian, he spoke Yiddish, he spoke Hebrew, a little Polish, but his English was extremely limited. You grew up in New York? I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Ah which is usually obvious uh, in about two minutes. People say, oh, what part of Brooklyn are you from when they hear my accent? Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I learned uh, English second, and the pediatrician, who did not speak Yiddish, assessed my uh, development in English, which was my weaker language, and informed my mother that, unfortunately, he said, Miriam is developmentally delayed. Mm. And so he advised her not to speak Yiddish to me because he was afraid it would make me confused. Oh my goodness. However, my mother thanked him very much and had the good sense to ignore him. Good. And so uh, I was able to have a very close relationship with my Zayda, with my grandfather. Mm. And I really, um, that, that was the beginning of my introduction to uh, bilingualism. Then mm. I met my cousins from Argentina. Mm -hmm. And my cousins from Argentina speak Spanish. Ah. And I remember very well when cousin Fidel, uh -huh. Fidel Forman, okay. came to visit us. Uh -huh. And uh, he spoke Spanish. He had, uh, and, and so, uh, he, although he spoke Yiddish to my parents, he had a friend with him who spoke Hebrew and I had already started school. And I was learning Hebrew half a day and English half a day. And so... Uh, it was like the United Nations. Everyone was translating it into everything else. Mm. And that's when I thought I really should learn to speak to my cousins. Mm. So I started um, mm. kind of informally being exposed to Spanish. And which part of Brooklyn was this? East New York. Okay. East New York. It's, um, mm -hmm. uh, I, we lived right near the New Lots train line. Mm. And in fact, when trains went by, the glasses in the china closet used to clink. Mm. And uh, <laughs> oh. no one had a car. 
Right. And everyone used public transportation. Wow. And when um, and I remember, I, I don't think I knew how to read yet, but my uh -huh. mother had me memorize all the stops on the train line, uh -huh. so that if anything happened, I wouldn't be lost. Were you a precocious child? Uh, I guess so. Bookish? Yeah, I guess I was. Yeah, Bookish? I love. I always loved to read. Okay. It was a tragedy if there was no book for me to read, uh. and I still remember my first library card. <gasps> that was, I still remember that. Which branch of the Brooklyn so Library? So we were, at that time we went to the li the Children's Library in Grand Army Plaza, mm. which was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I remember practicing to write my name in script because you had to do that for your library card. Mm. And I used to call it real writing. I don't know why we called it that, but we called it real writing. And I practiced doing my name in script. And uh, uh, I remember my first book. Which it was? It's called A Dance for Susie. Ah. And I can still see the book. Ah. And I just treasured that book because wow. it was the first book that I took out of the library. And then this is a future educator here. Right. Right, right. So then uh, in terms of college, what did you have a sense of what your major would be, what you were going to, your no, life path would be? No, I had absolutely no idea. Um, I, I, I went to uh, yeshiva for the first uh, nine years mm -hmm. um, from kindergarten through eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a yeshiva, a yeshiva University High School for two years. Mm -hmm. And after that, I transferred to Thomas Jefferson, which was our local high school in East New York. So mm -hmm. I graduated from Thomas Jefferson. Okay. And I went to Brooklyn College. Mm. And it never occurred to me that I could go anywhere else because that mm. was a very respected college, and that's yes. where that's where you went. This was a working class neighborhood. Yes. And uh, I now it, living in a middle class town, I see the kids. They they think about should I go to Harvard? Should I go to Yale? Yes. But the big deal where I was was Brooklyn College. Yes. And so I went to Brooklyn College, where I promptly failed the English test <laughs> oh. <laughs> because I spoke English like I came from Brooklyn. Oh. And at that point, I thought I might like to be uh, an early childhood teacher. Oh. And uh, so they put me in remedial speech. Uh-huh. And uh, I was very lucky because the teacher mm -hmm. for remedial s speech was a professor named Paul Lyon. Mm -hmm. And he had a radio show for Pacific Ra uh, Pacifica Radio. Oh. And he also was a voice coach mm -hmm. for actors. And so what he told all of us was, there's nothing wrong with the way you speak. I don't have to fix you. We are going to learn to play a role. And the role was a middle class academic who, was, who spoke an academic variety of English. And that was, that was wonderful. And that was my introduction to phonology, to prosodic features, um, to pragmatics, to nonverbal communication because he dealt with all of these elements of communication and helping us add an, addition, an additional way of using the language. And I, I think that's, that was my, that's, that's, that was the seed of, of when, when I thought, uh, when I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think that was the seed of my interest in linguistics. And I'm fascinated by this because of course Pacifica, they are the producers of WBAI, right. which was which the famous, you know, we left, always, left leaning we radio always station listen to, listen in to New that. York City. Mm -hmm. It became very famous when George Carlin, they, they aired the seven dirty words you can't say on television, right? That was WBAI did oh, that I didn't in the that. 70s, correct? And even now, Lenny Lopate has a show on WBAI. They've always been very into culture and the arts. And so this was a station you had on in your home. Well, they listen, we listened to that. We also listened okay. to WEVD, hmm. which uh, had, had uh, Yiddish programs at that time. It, they called it the station that speaks your language. Ah. And uh, so my Zayda, who was Yiddish dominant, and uh, uh, took care of me until I was eight because my dad was ill and my mom was out working. Hmm. So my Zayda took care of me. And, I, and my first literacy experiences were when wow. he would read the newspaper in Yiddish, the wow. Zeitung. And so that was my first reading, and um, uh, it was, you know, wow. it was just wonderful. Wow, you know, this is a wonderful relationship. So fascinating, because there's also the Yiddish theater, too. Well, I did go to the Yiddish theater okay. with my mom. Yeah. And I remember we saw Molly Pickon in The Kosher Widow. Oh. And, <laughs> uh, and the, the, the people in the theater uh, tended to be older. Uh -huh. And because uh, I'm probably one of the last generations of uh, Jewish people who are progressive who speak Yiddish. Oh. 
The ah. Hasidim still speak Yiddish. It's very yeah. vibrant in that community, but um, uh, very few people who are who live in the assimilated world, mm. uh, like me, speak Yiddish unless they're professors or they they're academics and they, uh, they there are there is a community of people who still speak Yiddish, but uh, it's not as broad. Was that the Lower East Side? Uh, there are people on the Lower East. Uh -huh. My father was born on the Lower East Side. Really? And he also came from a Yiddish-speaking home, so okay. he's, but he spoke a different Yiddish variety. Wow. He was a Glitziana. Uh -huh. And my grandfather offered my mother money not to marry him. I see. Because, <laughs> oh my. because of his dialect. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> to state the obvious, yes. she didn't take it. Right. <laughs> Fascinating. So that's an interesting, this whole acting theatrical aspect to your development and growth that this person who was into, into the acting arts, you know, he saw that in you and he gave you that advice. Did you ever think of going into acting? Or no, I, no, I never, okay. never even occurred to me. But what, what, at one point I thought I wanted to uh, join the Peace Corps oh. and I had my foreign language that I studied was French and oh. I was supposed to go to Togo and I was going to be a public health worker in Togo. Oh. And the Vietnam War happened, okay. and uh, uh, in the end, I didn't go to Togo. Mm. And, uh, but I, I got a job for a French magazine called Réalité. I had, I had studied uh, the Cours de Civilisation Française at the Sorbonne, oh. and I came back. That was after I graduated from undergraduate. I came okay. back, and I got a job at a magazine. Right. And uh, I was enjoying it, but then I thought, well, I really want to formally study Spanish. This was always... Okay a bee in my bonnet that I wanted to okay, learn Spanish. Okay, okay. And I had acquired a little bit of it, mm. but I really wanted to study it. So um, mm. I started going on the weekends to the new school, uh -huh. and I took a Spanish, you know, a Saturday yes. morning Spanish course. Huh. And sitting next to me was a priest mm. who, uh, who was from Bed-Stuy. Mm. And we got to know each other, and he said, you know, and I had an early childhood license. Mm. And a bi I also had a bilingual English-Spanish license and an ESL license because mm. I never wanted to be unemployed. I thought it would right. be a really good idea to have, <laughs> to have all these Cover teaching all licenses. Your bases. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and uh, I was starting to, to feel in mm. terms of the magazine. I loved it. It was creative. It mm. was fast. I met a lot of wonderful, really interesting people mm -hmm. uh, from all over the world who spoke different varieties of French. Okay. But uh, I, I, I started to feel like I wanted to do something that was more uh, focused on social action. Mm. And so he said, well, you know, we really could use you in bed -Stuy. Mm. So I wound up getting a job at two schools. Wow. And I, would, uh, I spent two and a half days in each school, and I worked with the English language learners mm. in the two schools. Mm. I, I just loved it. Wow. There's that famous photograph of Bobby Kennedy when he was running for president in 1968, and he visited Bed-Stuy. So that was always you know, a neighborhood to, to try to help out. Um, interesting. I didn't know about the French connection in your biography. Maybe you can go deeper into that in terms of the French culture, well, what cinema, happened, or yeah. anything like that. Okay, or, well, what, yeah. what happened was when I started the, uh, the Yeshiva University High School, mm -hmm. um, I, w I was put into the class where they taught French as a foreign language. Mm. And I had this wonderful teacher named Monsieur Machal. Hmm. And he, um, he was just, he just loved the language and loved the culture hmm. and really was able to uh, mm -hmm. impart an enthusiasm about, about learning and ab about yes. poetry and the literature and the, just the beauty of expression of the language. And he, hmm. uh, he taught us, we had to memorize some of the poetry of Jean de La Fontaine. Mm. And uh, mm. it, was, so that was, it was just so, so rich. It was, it was mm. a great experience, and, and we had to learn the, the uh, map of France and the different departments in France. Mm. And uh, because he was a native speaker, he would tell us jokes. Ah. You know, he would tell us jokes in French. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, we just picked up this wow. enthusiasm that he had for the mm. language and culture. Wonderful. And so then when I went to Brooklyn College, yeah, yeah. so I continued with the French, okay. and I, I just enjoyed it. You know, I just really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. I love language, I love culture, and it, okay. was, it was a window on another way of thinking and another, you know, just an, 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 another dimension to how people could look at life. Mm. And I enjoyed it very much, and so that's why when I graduated, mm -hmm. 
Um, with a degree in? With a, with a degree in French and early childhood education. Ah. And then I took, uh, and then I took some courses in, uh -huh. in music and dance. Okay, okay. Very well-rounded, very humanistic yeah. education. We talk a lot about on our show how we're losing the humanities. There was an op-ed in the New York Times two weeks ago about this, about how the colleges now are killing the liberal arts and the most, the most popular major now is business, you know. And so someone like yourself has so much to offer and share. And just the way you speak so beautifully, so articulately, you know, I mean, see, ladies and gentlemen, this is what with you, my Brooklyn accent, you with a little Brooklyn <laughs> accent. Why not throw it in there? You know, that's great. That's wonderful. So at one point, then you did you decide to go into the profession of, of education? Was that coming later in your doctoral studies or your master's? Well, no, I, I mean, I yeah. thought about it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I mm -hmm. thought about different possibilities. And mm -hmm. actually, the way I wound up failing the English test was that I said I thought I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. Mm. And in those days, you had to pass an oral examination. Oh. And so they gave me something to read. Yes. And I had gotten the English award mm. at, uh, at Thomas Jefferson High School. Ah. So I didn't think I would have a problem reading something. <laughs> no. And they gave me something to read, and I read it in my Brooklyn accent. And uh, <laughs> they said, uh, go directly to remedial speech, do not oh. pesco. <gasps> oh, and no. uh, in fact, the first time I was observed, mm -hmm. and it was a kindergarten class, mm -hmm. and I brought my guitar. It was a health lesson, and uh, I chose a, a song called Oh Mommy, Oh Mommy, Come Wash My Face. Mm. And each child would say someone in their family who helped them get ready for school in the morning. And I tried to make it very open. You know, children had different uh, uh, configurations of families. And I just tried to be, you know, like whoever helped you in the morning. I, I got them to talk about it. Mm. And we, we put it into the song. Mm. And so at the end of it, everybody was very engaged. We had a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I just thought I did a good job. Mm. And then uh, the um, supervisor sat down with me, and I was ready to hear how great I was. Mm. And she said, my dear, don't you know, mm -hmm. nobody wants his child to come home speaking English the way you do. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, wow. I, I went to the bathroom and cried for a half an oh. hour. It was terrible. Is there a connection between language and power and language and social class in terms of how people speak? You know, I talk about finishing schools and talking the Queen's English and all that. Does that still go on in this country? Are we judged by how sure. we sound? Sure we are. Mm -hmm. Sure we are. Mm. Uh, uh, the, the speech encodes your social class and your ethnicity mm. unless you choose to uh, mm -hmm. make a change. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. what, what I learned from Paul Lyon was I didn't have to make a change. I could just acquire another way of using English. Wow. And the same is with Spanish. I have relatives in Argentina and relatives in Puerto okay. Rico, and okay. they use Spanish differently. And then wow. when I when I went yeah. I went to Cali, Colombia, they use Spanish differently. <laughs> and when I went to Spain, they use Spanish differently. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so so mm -hmm. I, I I think what what I learned along the way is that language and culture uh, mm -hmm. are very rich, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. we uh, you should never say to someone that the speech of, of their community is wrong. Mm. You don't have to fix anybody Correct. who is able to communicate with you. Correct. But you can give them the option of wow. learning another way of using the language. And that's the option that I was given. And I, it, I learned a lot from that. And then I decided wow. I was just fine sounding like I was from Brooklyn. Mm. But I do shift. I do shift a, along a continuum. Well, Brooklyn is cool now, so you sound like you come from Brooklyn. That's a badge of honor in these days, okay? Um, interesting, wow. Like I remember, because I'm also an English teacher, full confession, English professor, and I was teaching in a school somewhere, I think it was in New York, CUNY, one of the CUNY colleges, and I had a, a woman from Latina background. She said to me, oh, 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 professor, could you fix my English? Please try to fix my English. And I said to her, you know what? And then I decided to give the whole class a lecture on the Spanish Armada when there was that battle with the English for primacy in North America and, the Spain, and Spain lost, the English won. And I said, but if the Spanish had won, 
you would be asking, I would be asking you to fix my Spanish because language and power go together. But English so, is now the supreme language of the world. Is that true? I wouldn't or, say that. I would yet. say it depends on, on where, Chinese, where in the world you are. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the three, the three biggest languages are uh, English, Mandarin, and Spanish. Mm, mm. And, uh, okay. and which one is more powerful depends on where you are. Uh, it's always an advantage to be multilingual. Mm. Because that, that just allows you to communicate much more with, you know, with many more people. Mm. But uh, mm -hmm. what, what I'm doing now is, is very slowly and painfully studying Mandarin because I have a lot of students from China. Oh. And you know, we were speaking about language varieties. Uh -huh. Well, um, this, the students from China speak many different, variety, mm. many different language varieties. Mm. And I mean, the Han uh, Chinese Umbrella includes seven language families, mm -hmm. and the three big Chinese languages in New York, you mm -hmm. know, which are Mandarin, Putonghua, mm -hmm. uh, Cantonese, and Fujianese. Each one comes from a different one of those language families, mm -hmm. and they have cognates, mm -hmm. but they're not mutually intelligible in normal speech. They're really quite different, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, people who speak a, a lot of these different varieties which in uh, Chinese are called fangyan, okay. and that means location language. Mm. But really, they're different languages in the sense that they are, they ha they are associated with distinct communities. Mm -hmm. They are not mutually intelligible in natural speech. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but, but, but they're considered, in the Chinese world, they're considered dialects, and the only real full-fledged language is considered to be Mandarin. Mm. And it is the biggest and most powerful one. But I, yeah. I tend to feel that languages, each, that each language uh, has its own um, mm. richness, mm. and that and language, mm. languages die when they're not mm. used when mm -hmm. they get extinguished by these big, powerful languages. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. secret to preserving a language, uh, the late Joshua Fishman said, uh -huh. is uh, intergenerational transmission. Mm. So I, ha I have a doctoral student now who yeah. is of Egyptian descent, okay. and she's working on Coptic. She's oh. a Coptic Christian, uh -huh. and Coptic is used in the church. But she found some families that are using it in everyday life. Mm. and are interested in revitalizing Coptic mm. so that it can mm -hmm. become more of, more of a, mm -hmm. a dispersed and everyday language again. And that was the original language of Egypt. Arabic mm. came later. Wow. You know, there's that famous example of the Eskimos who had like so many words for snow, right? Like, like I mean, language gives you tools for thinking about reality and maybe different languages, you could actually think different thoughts. Oh yeah, there are, every yeah. language, is, mm -hmm. language has expressions that are very hard to translate and still get the whole feeling uh, of them. So for example, mm. um, Yiddish, Yiddish has, uh, has, has words that, you know, you, just, it, you can say them, you know, you, you, you can paraphrase them, right? But you can't necessarily get the same, the, the same feeling from them. So there's the word nachas. Hmm. Right, and nachas is the joy that you get uh -huh. from the success or happiness of someone you have nurtured. Beautiful. We need a word like that in I English. I don't think we English has that word. Like that. Wow, not just nachas. 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 <gasps> Wonderful. Wow. So every language has expressions like that, and I often ask my students it. to to share uh, uh, words in their languages you know, that, that have that kind of special meaning that, mm. are, that is hard to translate. What about the Romance languages, like, how, like French and Spanish and Italian, somehow they got And Catalan. And Catalan. Right. What is, the, what is the link between love and amour and romance? Oh, I don't know. That's I mean, the, <laughs> people say French is the language of love. <laughs> That's true. And I, I'm not quite sure how that happened. We need an investigation into this. Yeah, <laughs> there is an article. There's, there's some. There's someone. Someone studied it and said, I'm sure. and it was about fr how how French is perceived as the language of love because yeah. there are all there people have all kinds of notions okay. about different languages which might or might not be true. Wow, I remember reading something Heidegger said. Heidegger had two words for community uh, that had to do with like 
One was mitzin. Mitzin is the is is uh, uh, to be being with. Mitzin, being with. And then there's mitwelt, which is the with world, the with world. So just hearing a word like that, it gives you a kind of reality that you didn't realize, you know, in terms of conviviality and connection. And maybe we need more of these concepts, you know, in our, in our country, in America. We need to learn how other cultures name things and describe different realities of, of human connection and love and caring. And well, I, I think I think that I think that's true. Yeah. I mean, my my mom came here from a little uh, shtetl in Ukraine, at, just a, outside of Kiev, yeah. and uh, she uh, didn't get to become literate there because there was a one-room schoolhouse, and the teacher was killed in a pogrom. Mm. And uh, her mm. mother was her mother never learned how to read and write actually, mm. Mm. and when they they came here, they hired uh, a people smuggler to get them out of what was then Russia, mm -hmm. and they got caught and they got put in jail, mm -hmm. and when they got out of jail, they had no money because the people smuggler had all their money, the coyote had all their money, mm -hmm. and so they found out where the guy lived and they sat in front of his house for several days and shamed him into taking them again. Mm -hmm. And the, set, the next time they managed to get to Bucharest. Wow. And in Bucharest, my grandfather was able to send them, who had come seven years earlier, uh -huh. he was able to send them a ticket and the boat, that they, they took a train and then they got on a boat called the New Amsterdam. Hmm. And it came to Hoboken. It, Hoboken, it went to Hoboken. Where we lived for 20 years. <laughs> Chloe I know and I that. were there I for a while. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he, and, and, wow. And she was, uh, and she used to sneak down. To, <laughs> she had a, a second-class ticket, but she told me that she used to sneak downstairs to where the uh -huh. children were in steerage and get uh, bring them fruit because oh. they had oranges. Oh. And she would bring them fruit. And one t one time they wouldn't let her back up. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! <laughs> and they goodness. couldn't communicate with the people on the boat, who I guess must have spoken Dutch. But even eventually, her her mom was able to explain <laughs> that her kid got stuck down there. Miriam is a woman of many stories. You will never run out of stories talking to Miriam. Fascinating, <laughs> fascinating life, traveling around the world, having these experiences, having these wonderful thoughts about education and language. But let's, before we, uh, this is going to go by so quickly, you know, um, let's get to the big issues now. Let's get to the big issues of bilingualism and multiculturalism so that if any education policymakers are, are listening, which we hope they are, that this could influence some policy. Mm -hmm. Let's just say if uh, Joe Biden, the Secretary of Education, should drop by and be sitting here. What, what, oh, Cardona's what, yes. wonderful. Oh, what advice wonderful. would you give this man? You know, I, I would take his advice. Okay. You know, Miguel Cardona has a, has okay. a master's in bilingual education. Oh. And, oh, and is does. is a big a big proponent of bilingualism and bilingual education. Okay, I would take his advice for sure. There you go. But uh, okay, for some reason, and uh, mm -hmm. the research on bilingualism mm -hmm. and bilingual education mm -hmm. really supports that it's an advantage to be multilingual and bilingual and biliterate, Ooh. and uh, your brain is better. <laughs> uh, there's uh, uh, the um, executive function. In the brain mm -hmm. actually is enhanced hmm. by uh, uh, in people who are bilingual, and wow. when you get older, um, you are much less likely to develop dementia. It's delayed by many wow. years. Wow! If you if you are bilingual, hmm. so it's really good for your brain, hmm. and it's uh, and it's also very good for for the country that you live in because you it makes you an asset in diplomacy, mm. right? Mm. In business. In thinking, wow. in flex cognitive flexibility, even huh. if you want to spy, <laughs> it's really much better to be bilingual. <laughs> Can I tell you a true story? Sure. My great uncle Larry was a spy who knew twenty languages. Twenty. He had his doctorate from Bern in Switzerland, and he knew twenty languages. Wow! Yeah. It really is a a big advantage to be mm. bilingual, and uh, mm, mm, mm. Uh, when 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 people come here, as my mom did. Right and don't speak English. Mm -hmm, my right. and my mom was illiterate. On top of it, they yeah. they just put her in kindergarten. She was 11 years old, and they put her in kindergarten. Wow. She was petite, but not that petite. Okay. And uh, but she was very lucky because there was a teacher in the school, and it was an Irish teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, the teacher just saw my mother really wanted to learn and would stay every day after school mm. and taught her English and taught her to read and write in English, mm. and. Um, she, I'm actually, I'm, I'm wearing her high school key. <laughs> Isn't that something? Good luck. 
Oh. Uh, and uh, she uh, she always wanted to learn, my mom, mm -hmm. and uh, so she she uh, was a native. She sounded just like a local native English speaker. Mm -hmm. um, of course, a native Yiddish speaker, and she was literate in Yiddish and English. Mm -hmm. And then she had studied some Hebrew, so she also knew some Hebrew and had some literacy in Hebrew. Mm. My grandfather also spoke uh, Yiddish and, and Hebrew. Okay. And uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish. He, wow. he studied in, in a gymnasia, so mm. he, he actually was schooled in Russian. Ah. And he served in the army under the Tsar in the Russo-Japanese War, and he was mm. up in Lake Baikal, and he would tell all kinds of stories mm. about that experience. Wow. And what caused him to leave was he got permission to live in Moscow, but oh. they wouldn't give him permission for his family to come because they were Jews. Right, right. And that's when he decided it was time to get mm. out of Dodge. Mm. And there were pogroms in the little town. Yeah. And every, every night my mother would ask her mother, do I sleep in my bed or in the oven? Oh my because gosh. That, because when oh. they would raid the town, sure. they, they would you know, rape sure. the women and you know, steal yeah. everything and burn everything. So for safety, she would sleep in the oven oh my if gosh. they thought there, there might be trouble. Did you see Fiddle, Fiddle Around the Roof when it first came out? Were I you, did. That, I took my that? mother. Really? We saw Fiddle Around <gasps> the Roof. What did she think? She loved it. She uh, said it really captured, rem captured her uh -huh. experience growing up in this, in this little shtetl. Mm. It was, she just loved it. She loved everything about it. And I loved it. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really great. I saw the Yiddish version. It really? wasn't as good. No kidding, okay. There were no scenery, they had no scenery, it had this paper bag. Right. That was it, no scenery. Uh -huh. Scenery was fabulous. Okay, right? okay. No, no scenery, and most uh -huh. of the actors were not Yiddish speakers. In New York City, Joel, yes. they couldn't find Yiddish speaking actors. I mean, really. Please. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and, and, and I mean, they, they did their best. And, um, uh -huh. and they didn't have zero Mostel. No, they didn't. No <laughs> zero Mostel. Uh, and they, yeah. uh, uh, the, it was, it was, so it was, it was, it was I mean, I love the idea of it. You mm. know, I love the idea. And actually the translator did a brilliant job. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And, uh, but, but most mm -hmm. of the audience couldn't tell. Okay. And uh, they, and, uh. and, and the songs were translated brilliantly. Mm. So like the song, If I Were a Rich Man, yeah. They, da, da, the guy da, da, wrote, da, da, da. If, I were, if I Were a Rothschild. Oh. So they, they, it was very thoughtful. However, yeah. uh -huh. the uh, subtitles, well, they were on the side, the side titles, <laughs> uh, said, If I Were a Rich Man, because what they did, what they did for the songs yeah. was they just put up the original lyrics of the songs. Right. So you couldn't tell mm -hmm. how brilliant this translator had mm -hmm. been wow. and how he translated the songs. So it had a lot of great things about it, but it, it wasn't like the wasn't like yeah. the original. And I was very disappointed that wow. that there weren't more native Yiddish speaking actors. Because when I go to the Volkspine, you right. hear people who speak Yiddish who can right. act in Yiddish. Before I say another word, let me look in the camera and say that in a better world, people like Miriam would be more famous than Kim Kardashian. <laughs> because so. we do no, so we need. A shift in the zeitgeist. We need voices like yours, articulate voices, who have something thoughtful to say about education to be heard by more people. Um, another full confession that Miriam and I both, uh, I also have a connection with NYU. I got my master's degree in the Steinhardt School in the 90s, so we know some of the same people. Yes. John Mayer was my professor, Gordon Pradle was my professor. And so let's put on our critical hats now, critical thinking and thinking about this kind of attack against bi bilingualism that was also very true, isn't that correct? Yeah, like I mean, in the I, 1980s, it's when still, Reagan no, it's still under attack. It's still it's under, still under attack. attack. Here's, that, here's the problem, yeah, here's yeah. the problem. The prob the pro first of all, mm -hmm. the research is very clear. Mm. Over 90% of decently done research that look at true bilingual programs, because mm -hmm. you could label a program bilingual because you have two words of another language in it, but mm. true bilingual programs that use both English and the other language, or in other countries, mm -hmm. different languages. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people who, who study in those programs actually are more successful in both languages. Mm. And over time, it, takes, it can take up to seven years to really develop academic literacy. But over time, not only do people have the gift of developing their own language, their first language, they also do better in English 
than people who are immersed in English, but half the time they don't know what's going on. It takes a while for them to figure out what's happening. And, um, and then th there's a model called the dual two-way immersion model, oh. which involves having people from two communities mm -hmm. learn each other's, la other's language as they go along. Oh. So I, I was telling you earlier that my grandson mm -hmm. uh, was just accepted to a school in Washington Heights called Dos Puentes, huh. Bridges. And that is a dual language school, oh. and so he is um, English dominant, but also speaks Spanish because mm -hmm. it's a family language. Mm -hmm. And so he will be going to school with some kids who are English speakers who are learning Spanish, mm -hmm. and some kids who are Spanish speakers who are learning English. And both languages are equally represented in the curriculum of the school. Mm. And that is one of the most successful models, and in general, all of the developmental bilingual models, which means that you keep learning both languages over time, students who go through that process are very, very successful. And I was lucky that I went to yeshiva. Mm. So we did English in the morning and Hebrew in the afternoon. Okay. And it started in kindergarten when mm. I was four years old. Mm. And I still remember my teachers and we had different mm. subjects in the, in the different languages. Uh. But I'll never sound like a native in Hebrew. A lot of my teachers were not natives. Yeah. But when I went to Israel, I could communicate with people. Wow. And they were surprised. Well, I just yeah. remember now that you have a great story about Deborah Tannen, the linguist. There's something you... Because you, you, I also admire the work of Deborah Tannen. Oh, I love her when work. When you talk about, like, pragmatics. Well, how yeah. does this play out in everyday life with relationships and friendships across cultures? How do we communicate better? Well... Yeah. I first met Deborah Tannen in San Antonio, mm. and I think the ink on her dissertation was, was still drying. <laughs> and uh, she, uh, and uh, uh, what she did was, uh, this turned into a book, I think it was her first book called Conversational Style. Mm. But what she did was, she was, she was living in LA, okay. and she had a Thanksgiving dinner. And she had New Yorkers and Californians at the Thanksgiving dinner, and she stuck a tape recorder next to the turkey. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of let it roll. And people, a lot of these people didn't know each other. Uh -huh. And then afterwards, she did a transcript of their conversation, and then she interviewed them afterwards mm -hmm. to see what they thought had gone on. Well, the New Yorkers have uh, a collaborative style. Yeah. So as you talk, I might say, oh, yeah, I, I get it. That's that, right. that happened yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah we overlap. Yeah, yeah. So she calls this co cooperative overlap. Uh -huh. uh, whereas... Uh, in my husband's culture, my husband is Anglo-Welsh, mm. one person speaks at a time. And it seems like in L.A. Mm. they have something more like that, that one person speaks at a time. Ah. And so they, uh, that, they don't understand that New Yorkers are, are not trying to interrupt them. We're just trying to show interest and engagement. Mm. But they experience that as, as, in, as, as rude. They think we're rude. Yeah. Ah. They, they, they think we interrupt them. But really, we're being friendly. And then the topics wow. that you can ask people when you don't know them very well, to show interest. Mm. Well, New Yorkers, want to, they, they want to know what, what's your job, what's your love life, what's your politics, you know, stuff that matters. <laughs> right, you know, on, but really, we really want to get to know you. Yes, yes. And apparently in California, that's intrusive. Ah. They think we're nosy. Well, we are nosy, but we're in a nice <laughs> way. So the, the Californians, apparently, yeah. according to Deborah Tannen, uh -huh. they, uh, uh, stay on safer topics, you know, kind of like they'll talk about movies, they'll talk about... I don't know, cars, whatever they talk about. They won't about. say, what do you do, as much as a New Yorker will say Maybe that. not. Yeah, okay. Maybe not. I'm not yeah. sure what the rules are. All okay. I know is that I probably break them all the time. <laughs> but this was, especially at the time that she did this, yeah. it was a very important, very important to understand that yes. even though we supposedly speak the same language, the way we convey our meaning, which is what pragmatics is, how do you mm. use language to convey meaning, was different. So she became uh, a rock star. She still oh, is yeah. a rock star. Oh, absolutely. In, in and she and she went yeah. she went on to look at women in the workplace. And she had one that I used to, one book that I really loved that I that I gave to my my younger daughter, and we both loved it. And it, it was called "You're Wearing That." You're wearing that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mothers and daughters. And it was about mo mothers and daughters communicating. Yeah. And, and and then she had one about men and women called "You Just Don't Understand." Right. And I, I, and I saw it when I was in Puerto Rico when it said, Tu no me entiendas. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that's been translated, I don't know, into 40 languages or something. Wow. It's wonderful. 
because she said something interesting, Deborah Tan, and I remember reading it, she said that all communication is cross-cultural in some extent. In some way, I think that's true. Because well, we all have different our, backgrounds. You're a guy, I'm a gal. <laughs> you know, we're from diff we we yeah. grew up in different places. Um, uh, so we have a lot of things in common, but yet, right. you know, there were, there were ways that, that, that were different, and that's going to affect our ability to successfully communicate. And uh, my, my husband and I once had, we, we never did it, but we had a bit of a fantasy that we would become uh, cross-cultural marriage counselors. Ooh. <laughs> or, or couples counselors. <laughs> and that. that we would help, and we would work with couples from different cultures on, yes. to help them with their communication. Because he's Anglo-Welsh, right? Wow. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish with Latin A flavor. Right. And, uh, wow. we, and, and he, his family were Anglican and Methodist. Huh. And then, then his uh, first wife's family and, and uh, his two children at that time were Catholic. They're evangelicals now, but they were Catholic. Yeah. My grandkids are Catholic mm. on that side. And I mean, so the two of us, and he spent 20 years as a professor in Puerto Rico, which is where we met. Mm. And it, we have like 12 different cultural uh, inter, inter, intersections that have to be overcome. <laughs> but, we, but we're both in this field. We do research together. We've oh. done a lot of research on pragmatics uh, and language attitudes in Puerto Rico. Wow. Here and on the circular migrants and wow. what their lives are like. Uh, oh my so, so we had the. Maybe we'll still do it. But we had this you know idea this that we could like, help people. Miriam, this sounds like a great Netflix series. <laughs> <laughs> you better Perhaps do that. so. That's <laughs> but I, I really want to say, John, I so appreciate Please. being able to talk about yes. the actual research on bilingualism and yeah. bilingual education because yeah. even though. As I said, over 90% of the research really shows that it's beneficial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Only 40% yeah. of what's in the media transmits that idea. Wow. So having, having it properly represented and in, accurately in the represented media, in the media is really important. It's, it's extremely important. I mean, we, we saw Bill McKibben give a talk uh, in a church uh, last Sunday in New York at the First Presbyterian Church in Greenwich Village, and he was saying about the media how they, they don't do a good job of reporting about the environmental crisis. So yeah, it's there's, on the a list. Lot, there's a lot of things that they're not reporting. But before we run out of time, I want to make sure I check my notes here because I have my cliff notes here. Oh. I want to make sure I cover all these great topics that we were trying to get to. Oh, I, I also want to tell this you about great. a project that yes. I worked on for the UN. Oh, please, get to that. And, yes. uh, okay, because yeah. I've taken, uh, in, in recently, even though I'm a please. digital immigrant, I've become interested in language and technology. Okay. Uh, and uh, I got invited to be the plenary speaker at a conference on, on language and technology. Ooh. I called it the journey of a digital immigrant. <laughs> wow. But, I, but uh, uh, one of my colleagues from NYU eventually wound up working, Pat uh, Duffy, mm -hmm. uh, wound up working uh, at the, the United Nations. Ooh. And so she uh, invited me to join her in developing uh, a website for English language learning. And the content Ooh. is all about the work that the United Nations does for peace and well-being wow. and health around the world. Oh. And so that was very, very exciting. And then mm. I got to use it. I thought this would be really great for high school kids. And so I got mm. to use it in a high school in New York City in a bilingual program Ooh. and in two classes in an English language arts class okay. and also in a, uh, an AP English class and it's very unusual for immigrant kids to have an opportunity to, to take AP English huh. but this, this, is, this is a wonderful school and so uh, I, got to, I got to use it with several classes and I had a wonderful volunteer teacher named Lauren McCoy Mm -hmm. who worked with me, and one of my doctoral uh, mm -hmm. students, Chen Sen Tsai, who has since uh, completed her doctorate. Oh, and her, her dissertation won the Nabe Great Dissertation Award, and she was looking mm -hmm. at attitudes towards different uh, mm. Chinese varieties. Mm. Mm. So anyway, I got to, I got to wor work on that, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have a section on language varieties mm. and how, mm. how they should be appreciated. 
Wasn't there a, 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 there was a push to create one universal language at one time? Oh, there's been a few of them. I mean, one of them was Esperanto, right? Uh, which was mm -hmm. which was kind of European based. Okay. And there is still an Esperanto society. Mm. That, you know, it's it's hasn't left us. And mm. then there was another one, that well, was kind of a competing one, mm -hmm. and um, so I mean, I, there there is there is a, a tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, that when communities need to get together for limited purposes, mm -hmm. often they develop mm -hmm. a kind of a combination language. Okay. And that's called a pidgin. Right. Two languages combine for right. limited purposes. Yeah. But then when uh, the when sometimes the place where they met mm -hmm. starts growing into a city mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. their their kids start speaking to each other in this pigeon, then they need a more elaborated language to mm. deal with more than just going to the market. And yeah. so that's how Creoles develop. It's the children who advance yeah. the language usually yeah, so, in a case so like that. Yeah. A Creole is, a, is the, des, the, the descendant of a pigeon that became elaborated. Mm -hmm. So if, there are many Creoles all over the world. And then there was that big debate about Ebonics, remember? Oh, and then we well, look right. at that and, and so, black vernacular English. All right, so let, let, yeah. me, let me talk okay. about that. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the neighborhood I grew up in, um, as I was gro growing, had, had a fair amount of African-American uh, yeah. families, and uh, a lot of them spoke African-American vernacular English. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, people believe that it's descended from a Creole that became decreolized. And, uh, but it's, it has its own grammar, its own phonology, its own pragmatics, and, yeah. and there's more than one variety of it, sure. too, depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. And so when I was at Teachers College getting my master's, uh, William Stewart, who was one of the leaders in studying mm. that variety, uh, actually gave a course that I was very fortunate enough to take. And then the head of the English program at Rutgers in Newark came to that course and recruited me. Really? Yeah. So then I got to work with a lot of the uh, students from Newark who actually spoke that variety, and I learned with them. It was, I learned so much from them. It was really wonderful. Wow. And then I was able to emulate my teacher, Paul Lyon, by really? telling them what he told me. And so we did contrastive analysis, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yes. then we looked at other, other English varieties. We looked at Appalachian English. Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. uh, it was a great. It was really a great, a great experience. And then when I went yes. to when I got my doctorate for my dissertation, I looked at attitudes towards different varieties of English among native and non-native speakers. Mm. So I had my native Brooklyn variety, and then uh, African American English, mm -hmm. and then two varieties that the students were not that familiar with. There was an Irish mm. variety, Irish accented English, and Hawaiian, Hawaiian Creole. It's called Pigeon, but it's really a Creole. You know, I was looking at the list of talking points oh, I yeah. wanted to cover, yeah. and one of them is motivation, uh, which is something I'm also learning about in my doctoral studies now. I'm getting a doctorate degree in educational leadership, focusing on creativity and innovation. And so one of these subject areas is, is motivation. and. How do, what motivates you and how do you motivate your students in this kind of work and this type of scholarship and research? What is what are some of the motivating Well, factors? I mean, the, yeah. there's a, um, yeah. a fellow named Sultan Dornier who mm -hmm. does a lot of work on language, language learning motivation. Okay. And uh, the early work tended to separate two major kinds of motivation for learning. One was integrative, where you really want to I want to sit on the Champs Elysees and have French food and drink French wine and, and sing French songs. Okay. That, that you want to be part of the culture. You know, yes. you want to be. Yeah. The other is instrumental. Well, I want I want to work in a hotel and make a lot of money, and I want to talk to those people. <laughs> yeah, I got you. And yeah. And we used to think that integrative motivation was always better, but it was only better if you live someplace mm. where you can actually hang out with those people, and oh. if you have integrate in, instrumental motivation. It can be very, um, you know, very powerful if, if you have a goal that involves that. Now it turns out that having both of them is even better. And there are subcategories of motivation mm. that, uh, that, that motivate particular individuals. Mm. Even wanting to know your enemy, we get back to the spies, right, yeah. can be a motivation. 
right? There, the, and, and also the, um, there is a concept that you have an imagined future self and you live in an imagined community, you have an imagined reality. And that can be very motivating hmm. because you see yourself having yeah. acquired that language hmm. and actually being able to use it in some kind of rich real real world world context so that you know that motivates you using your imagination yeah. to fantasize about that future right and and that can and be mo your motivation to yeah. do anything or to learn anything that you can imagine yourself in the future having acquired whatever it is you're learning you know it might be it might be fixing motorcycles but it it's it's this imagined self that can really spur you on because you you want to get there so Claudia and I, we can imagine our show as being very successful. It is Ima successful. Imagine it being funded, being funded by people who will give us money to actually do this. Well, you were nominated living. for a big prize, weren't you? We were nominated for the Yidon Prize, the equivalent of a Nobel Prize in education. What, one thing that, that, yeah. that I didn't get to say that I wasn't sure to say please. is that it's, it's counterintuitive mm -hmm. that if you spend yeah. more time being exposed to English and less time uh, developing another language, whether it's your heritage language uh -huh, or your uh -huh. native language or a language that you'd like to learn, it's counterintuitive that that actually spending more time on the other language mm. as well as English will make your English better. Mm. So not only will mm. you have the benefit of being bilingual, wow. but you actually, actually because you become so enriched cognitively, mm you actually, over time, your English is better than someone who just had only English. Well, now I have a memory that just came back because I remember years ago, I was in my 20s, and I had a crush on a Latina <laughs> woman, and I was... I, I, th I think I was, it, it, history, history was, repeated but it, itself. It and... <laughs> my wife is from Colombia. I know. But I was working with this, this, this guy, and he was my colleague at work, you know, and he was Spanish background, you know, and I said to him, how do you say I love you in Spanish? <laughs> Te amo. Right. And I said, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> you know. Apparently it worked. It was motivating. It was yeah. motivating. But I think I need a lot more to learn in, in terms of my Spanish and brushing up, and it's something I would like to do. I, really, I want to make this statement to the world right now. I, I, I'm not a bilingual yet. I know some Spanish. I mean, I'm married to a woman who's from Colombia. I, I know certain words, though. I know certain words, like... For example, in, in Colombian, maybe that's the dialect, but, uh, or maybe it's in Spanish, I don't know, the word for lazy is loches. And I like that. It well, that's it sound, only in, in yeah. the center of the country. Of the country, okay. So when, when, uh, when we feel like on a Sunday morning when you just want to lounge around, let's be loches. It's, it's such oh, a lovely that. word yeah, to be loches, you know. Parasoso is the word I know. <laughs> 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 or, or if you're, or if you're grumpy, you know, to be grumpy. Oh, you're so cochito, cochito, chochito. Chochito. I'm sorry, chochito. It's so, it takes the edge off, you know. It has a nice. I like that. It's like such that. a beautiful language, and I, I want to vow to learn more. Well, Spanish. we have we have a program in uh -huh. uh, the national organization in Nabe okay. called Language Ambassadors, yeah. because we really want to grow our Nabe family and okay. have many many languages and oh. cultures represented. Wow. And so we have an Italian ambassador, a Turkish ambassador, a mm. Persian ambassador, mm. uh, two indigenous ambassadors, oh. um, uh, many, you know, many different languages and cultures. And we have an African languages ambassador. Okay. And I, I think that when people think of Nabe, because Spanish is the big language, uh, mm. uh, second language uh, of our country, mm -hmm. they often think of that. But we really want to mm -hmm. be, re uh, want to represent the voices mm -hmm. of all of the multilingual communities in the country and beyond. Thank you for talking about the indigenous because uh, we forgot to do something. I, I said to Claudia earlier, let's begin the program with a um, land acknowledgement. This has become a new oh, thing yes. now and we, we like to do that. So let's just say that we are on stolen land right here in, in beautiful you know, South Orange, New Jersey. It's, it's a lovely community, but it's on stolen land. People lived here before. I believe it's the Lenny Lenape who uh, the, the lived Lenny in this Lenape area. The Lenape tribe. So let's ask for forgiveness and try to do better. And, and those things are not good that happened in the past. And that has to be remembered uh, along with slavery and those terrible things. And those have to be acknowledged. And 
how we move forward and try to make a better no, world. No, I think we have to yeah. acknowledge our past yeah. and acknowledge things that should have done better uh, in, mm -hmm. in, order, in, in order to move forward. And yeah. uh, uh, there are different communities in our country who mm -hmm. uh, were, mm -hmm. were, were, were stripped of their resources. Correct. And then going forward, Correct. They, the people who took the resources, their progeny benefit, benefited. And the people mm -hmm. who lost their resources, mm -hmm. their progeny did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, we'll, you know, we have to have some accountability for that. That's, I think that's very important. And just by saying that here in the show, it goes out into the world and it radiates out, you know. And uh, I always like to say on every show, I like to quote from Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian education philosopher who said, we need to teach for a world in which it's easier to love. And oh, how it, beautiful. It, yeah. Uh, teach for a world that's more just, loving, kind, and peaceful. And without the loving support of Claudia, my darling wife, Claudia, Canasto, Chibuki, the three names, this show would not exist. So love is an existential reality in the world. People like Bell Hooks and Eric Fromm have written about love. So love is real. Be more loving, be more kind. And thank you so much, Mim, for spending time with us. Our conversation will go on because you're a friend, but I'm glad the world got to hear a little bit about bilingualism. Closing thoughts. I want you to finish the show. Any closing thoughts about today and about but why bilingual education? Well, matters? I, I yeah. hope that yeah, yeah, yeah. more people will appreciate the value of okay. the value of keeping their languages, growing their languages, mm -hmm. becoming more multilingual, mm -hmm. and widening their understanding of the riches that are all around us and appreciating mm. those riches instead of trying to um, make everybody monolingual and monocultural. It, it, it impoverishes us to do yeah. that, and it, it enriches us mm -hmm. if we uh, support bilingualism, bilingual education, multilingualism. And also, I think it leads to work for peace. Because if you understand and humanize other people, then it makes it more possible to work for, work for peace. And, uh, I'm part of a movement called the Givat Chaviva, which is the Center for a Shared Society. And they have bilingual schools mm -hmm. in the Middle East uh, where kids learn Arabic and Hebrew and learn to appreciate each other. Wow. And I think we need more of that in this world. We do. Thank you so much. I pre we appreciate you being on our show, and we really appreciate your friendship. Thank you. Same here. Okay. Igualmente. <laughs> Thank you.